You know, I tried to get a, uh, an American flag for the background oh, yeah. of this episode, <laughs> but uh, we just didn't have the budget. Oh, we should have just gone to the local elementary school. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you'll have to settle for this non-flag-waving edition of Polite Fight. I am John Tatey, joined, as always, by Gus Spellman, and we're here to talk about Nailed. A little late this week, because I was out of town. Apologies for the delay. In Miami. Yeah, <laughs> in Miami. Um, so we're eager to get going. There's a lot to pack in here. Great episode. Gus, for me, the shot of the episode uh, is this rainbow shot, although there's a number of shots of the episode we could pick too, mm -hmm. but this is right after Kim has gotten the Mesa Verde account back. We see in the background Kim silently exulting over this call, and she's at the end of this rainbow. Meanwhile, Jimmy is in the foreground painting the walls brown. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, Gus, this is such a great visual representation of what's going on here. Kim has benefited from Jimmy's colorful uh, tactics, right? We talked about the Xerox color mm -hmm. sign uh, last week. We've talked about color all season. Gus keyed into it from the beginning. So Kim is standing in the pot of gold created by this colorful tactic that Jimmy undertook. And meanwhile, Jimmy's got the brown, which to me sort of gets at how he's just going to pretend this is all normal. And mm -hmm. he, yeah. you know, yeah. it's just straightforward <laughs> brown wall Jimmy. But the shot gives us the reality of the situation that Kim isn't yet aware of. I love the moment that they choose to show it to you too. It's just like right at the end of the conversation, it's all a done deal on her end and you get this thing which expresses what she's feeling but it also kind of gives it this sense that it's like a fantasy. Great, and uh, listen Paige, thank you. Thank you. Sure. And just that way that they sure. withhold like it that. until this moment. It punctuates the end of that phone call, end of the phone call, end of the rainbow perfectly. Yeah. A lot of great editing choices, I think, mm. in this mm. episode. Let's talk about another, this is sort of more of an editing pattern that they create for probably the centerpiece scene of this episode, the Chuck, Jimmy, yes. Kim, all three of them together, as you pointed out. That's right, the three, it, it comes to a head. It's all, a, go ahead. What I love about this is that you, the whole time, are thinking, what is Kim gonna think? You know, you basically know what Chuck's gonna say. You basically know what Jimmy is gonna have to say. At the beginning, when Chuck starts making his accusation, you're getting a little bit of all three of them. You're getting Jimmy playing innocent, you're getting Chuck laying out his case, and you're getting Ray Seahorn sort of watching a little bit. But then when it gets to the point where you've got Chuck and Jimmy sort of going back and forth, they stop cutting to Kim, and the whole time I was like, I just want to see Kim. I just want to see Kim. I just want to see Kim. And then they finally go back to her. I just thought that was such a great, smart way to raise the tension while also having a conversation that's proceeding at a completely normal pace. Well, I think it does raise the tension, like you say, Gus, and I think it also accomplishes something by getting at the emotional reality here, which is that Kim kind of has been cut out of this transaction that involves her quite deeply. Once again, she has to cast her lot with one McGill brother or the other. Mm -hmm. We have Chuck telling her, what was it, that you have no choice? You have no choice, yeah, yeah. Which, um, uh, you have a comment about that, right? Yeah, there's a great comment from Dr. Emilio Lizardo. He says you can see the moment where she makes her decision, not the moment where her mind is changed, but the moment she makes her decision. And yes. it's the moment where Chuck says, you have no choice. You have no choice. And I thought that was great because I think in another show, she would just be there to defend Jimmy. And I think that by putting the moment based on Chuck sort of challenging her, it sort of gives her the agency and makes the decision about her relationship with Chuck as much as her relationship with Jimmy, which I think ties up really well with what you're saying about being caught between the two Miguel brothers. Right. She's in this weird love-hate triangle, yeah. right? I'm with you, Dr. Emilio. I'm actually going to add something. I think that when Chuck says you have no choice, he's kind of right. And I think the way it plays out is not what he has in mind. But Kim, in practical terms, has no choice but to go along with Jimmy right. now and to take his stance that it was a mistake because her mm -hmm. whole life stretches ahead of her, right? She can either take Chuck's advice and mm -hmm. destroy her own career or she can go with Jimmy's ruse and say Chuck made the mistake. And so she, she goes Jimmy's way because it's the only way to preserve the life she's built for herself and that the McGill brothers seem determined to destroy. I do want to look at two shots here, and I guess I'd call this costume design, but it's really just the wonderful uh, dramatic versatility of this 
dumb space cloak <laughs> that Chuck wears, right? So in the scene where he and Howard are back at his house, it looks, I mean, like what it is, this big square of aluminum foil draped over a crazy person. Mm -hmm. And I think it makes you sympathetic with Howard's point of view in terms of like, how could you believe this shiny, crazy right. man, right? right? But then at the beginning of this confrontation between Jimmy, Chuck, and Kim, we have this low angle shot that makes Chuck almost look like a judge from a sci-fi yeah. movie, right? And he clearly is considering himself the judge, jury, and executioner in this interaction. And then he even like stands up and discards his cape with a flourish and becomes like super right. lawyer. Great staging, which, great use of the costume. Which also, it's important, I think, to have him lose that when he's making the case to Kim. She's not seeing him the way that Howard saw him. She's seeing him as more exactly. reasonable. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I wanted to talk about two different sounds that I think kind of um, bookend Chuck's Sounds? We don't do story. sounds too often. Well, uh, one sound at the beginning, pretty close to the beginning of the episode, really right there, filled yeah. me with dread. When Chuck and Howard are leaving to go to the court after Chuck's been like, I'm gonna be fine. They have the mailbox opening and closing, and the way that it closes, just this horrible screech. And, you know, we've seen this mailbox open and close before, and it's never sounded quite this intense to me before. And in that moment, I was like, Chuck is gonna die. I, now, I thought it was gonna really? be in this courtroom scene, yes. At that moment, I was just, it wasn't a surety, but I just had this feeling. With this inkling, yeah. Yeah, I was again, I was struck by the sound at the end of the episode, then, when Chuck falls over and it's this horrifying splat. And it again gives you this sense that, you know, it feels like something very bad has just happened to Chuck. You know, I didn't find the mailbox, I did, it was accentuated, mm -hmm. but it wasn't over the top. Mm -hmm. And I felt the same about this smack on the counter. You know, usually when you hear like a punch sound in a TV or movie, it has a like crack and snap to it that is not real. You right, know, when right. someone gets punched, it's more of a like wet thud, right? And that's the sound when his, head hits on that counter, it's just sort of this wet thud and it's sickening because of how real. It, it's hmm. not bombastic, it's not sort of this storytelling version of a, of the face being hit. Maybe it, I was wearing, maybe because I was wearing my editing headphones, these things popped out to me stronger than they would have if you were wearing. It's a great wearing. way to watch the show with headphones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just so very do you struck think, by Are you saying you think this is like a movie crack it's that we're doing here? Uh, let's listen to it yeah, listen on to the it. crappy laptop speakers. Right, not walk away from me. We are not finished here. Done talking to you, man. You know what it is? It's that that sound, which is a very organic, squishy sound, comes juxtaposed with all of these electronic mm -hmm, sounds. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what makes it stand out to you a little bit more. To take it a little bit further, all that electrical stuff, we know that that's not really real for Chuck, and I think it hammers home that whatever happened with this smack, that is real, and that is gonna have a real effect. Good point, love that. I wanna get your opinion on this uh, shot that jumped out to me of Kim and Jimmy mm -hmm. in bed. <sighs> This to me, it felt so strange on Better Call Saul, and I think purposely so. It feels like the most standard domestic sitcom framing of this scene. Totally, and I have yeah. an idea about it, but I want to get your take on it. Well, to me, I wasn't keying in on it as a sitcom thing necessarily, mm -hmm. although you're totally, now that you say that, I very right? much feel that way. Looks like everybody else is framing. Yeah, yeah. But to me, it was just like, this is the most domestic, solidly couple-y thing we've ever seen them do, and it both, makes it feel like they are in it for the long haul together and makes it feel like, I guess maybe a little bit of the romance is kind of gone from it because this yes. sort of framing is, you know, it's not that interesting. It's an artificial feeling shot and I, th I think that's an important part of it because with Jimmy being the sort of avatar of pop cultural memory, to me it just immediately made me think like this is so fake and cardboard and stilted mm -hmm. right now. What I keyed in on going right into this was the toothbrush motif that we've talked about before. It's so awesome how eloquent they're able to be with some of these motifs. Just, you know, this time it's Jimmy brushing his teeth alone. Last time it was Kim yeah. brushing her teeth alone and like, you know, just looking like. Even which to I have think, these two toothbrushes in the cup yeah, leaning, leaning away, away from exactly. each other. That's exactly what I was gonna say. Yeah. It just, you really, you can really chart their relationship 
through these toothbrushes, <laughs> which is really uh, just great it's, filmmaking. It's great visual storytelling, I agree. Um, we could do a whole episode, I think, about some of the mic shots in, in this uh, installment of Better Call Saul, but we don't have time to get into all that. So I just want to talk about one thing that I've noticed, Gus, which is uh, at the end of this episode, we have Jimmy watching the action from across the street. And to me, it's a touch at the tail end of this episode that indicates that Jimmy and Mike's lives are sort of Falling into a uh, uh -huh. similar arc. Because it's something that we've seen Mike we've do seen so Mike many times, watching people from across watch, the street. And he does it a lot in this episode. He did it a lot last week. What struck me is that when Mike does it, it feels like it's coming from a position of strength. Like yeah. he has the upper hand. But when Jimmy does it, it feels like a position of weakness, especially yeah. at the end where he's he, like, call 911. Yeah, yeah exactly. and he, where he recoils. I mean, to me, there's a very direct parallel in the episode when Mike is watching Hector he's also watching a sick man like almost freak out and his reaction is literally just one eyebrow raised and Jimmy's reaction is his whole body recoiling when he sees this happening to Chuck and it just shows you the similarities and I think the differences in their approach to this sort of thing Mike is just so much more comfortable with it I mean we've talked about like whether or not Mike and Jimmy's storylines will meet up, but I think in this episode they're a great foil for each other because yes. they both end up with these unintended consequences. Like Mike ends up being the cause of this innocent guy dying and you can tell how much that affects him even though he's been so cool. And Jimmy has been trying to be cool the whole episode when it happens, he just freaks out. They've done a good, they've, I it's think they've rescued this if, parallel for me. Uh, me too, and it's almost better with them on separate tracks but echoing each yes. other. Then I mean I love when they're when they're working together too, but uh, this is a great dynamic. Um, we could talk about a whole another twenty minutes yeah. worth of stuff from this episode, but we're going to let you continue the conversation in the comments. Thanks as always for your insights. Until next week, I'm John Tatey for Gus Spellman. So long for now. Bye guys. We jam packed that one. Yeah, we did. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope we got that. <laughs> <laughs>